This month's Where Did the Road Go is brought to you by eight amazing people. Greg Ross, Illuminati, Allison Cook, Super Inframan, 36 Dingo, Michael Fritschke, Yvonne Williams, and Doug Malam. Thank you all so very much for helping make this show possible. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Quick introduction to this show. In this show, we will be dealing with themes of religion, extreme religion, or, uh, you know, religious extremes, as well as mentions of suicide and such. I just want to give you a heads up before we go into this, uh, what I felt was a very interesting conversation. There you go. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? And tonight I have with me Amber, the witch of Nakalula. Did I get that right? Nakalula. Nakalula. I did get that right, I think. Yeah. Lula. Lula. Yes. All right. And uh, you you had written me about, uh, you kind of teased some experiences that I was quite interested in. So since you have an, uh, enough stuff that uh, we can do a show, we're focusing on you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I guess I'll just preface by talking a little bit about the background of, I guess, I'll go into the etymology of the word demon and goetic just a little bit. Okay. And I'll talk about, first of all, I'll, I guess I'll just sort of talk a little bit about the background and set this up, like why we have certain connotations with these, whether you want to call them thought forms or energy beings or just part of our psychology, our bicameral mind. Why do we have such a negative connotation with that word and these things and these, some people consider them actual entities like literal mm -hmm. devils and demons. And I think it really can be broken down into looking at history and the victors of history and, and, you know, the, the dominant group think they always write the narrative. They write the history yeah. and, and the adage that history is basically the story of the conquerors is that's, that's very true. Graduate school, one of the periods that I studied was the Middle Ages and it basically medieval literature in particular. And with that came looking back at the burning times and the, <laughs> into that led me down a path, which I was already aware of because I had studied it before, but the grimoires, the goishas, and it sort of just rekindled my interest in a lot of things occult because I've been into the occult since a very young age. Okay. So, so what got you into it in the first place? I, I, the only way I can say it is because I was always called it, whether as a slur or just a fact, as a funny thing, like a joke, I was always called a witch. Okay. So I, I just, I'm just a born witch. And I think the interesting thing about my family, it's they themselves, they did not really demonize that so much as I think it was just different or maybe kind of weird, at least my mother and my grandmother. So my mother read a lot of interesting things back in the 60s and 70s about Edgar Casey and stuff like that. And so she had some old books and my grandmother's family always had a weird sense of um, time and space. And they could always do this thing called dream walking. Oh. And my grandmother and I used to talk about that. My my dad can kind of do it too, but it freaks him out. It's lucid dreaming, you know, or astral traveling or whatever new age term you want to put upon it. Right. Um, we just always been able to have fun dreams. And I guess even though they definitely had the dressing of Christianity, um, it, they were first and foremost, my mother and my grandmother would have been some more spiritual. I remember there was a time where people in my life where I was breaking up with the next fiance and people were bring, being really ugly to me about, you know, just not being religious, but yet being okay with being a witch and being witchy and spiritual and into yoga. <laughs> And she actually stopped calling herself a Christian and started calling herself a Methodist mm. because she did not like the way people were treating her granddaughter. That was my grandmother. And my grandmother, I would have even asked me, I would have said she's very religious. But, you know, the group think didn't come before family. It didn't right. come before integrity and it didn't come before love. That's awesome. So because there, there's something higher out there 
than just obedience to a group. And and I think when we talk about light bringers in the left-hand path, that's actually what we're talking about. Like that love being the strongest emotion and 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 the light bringer bringing in the light. Because how do you slay a vampire? You drag it into the light. Right. That's the best way to slay a vampire without being gory. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, to me, I've always had a very positive, just positive, nothing but either good vibes, maybe intense messaging, but just a lot of love there from those things that people are typically afraid of, or they just want to define as evil or write off as just brain farts. And I'm not a religious person. I, I don't have I don't have a set of beliefs. I'm, I'm a member of the Satanic Temple, so I'm a non-theistic Satanist. Right. You know, and, and we're more, more focused, of course, on separation of church and state campaigns and, and such. Yeah. And, and, and the legality of stuff like that. But I'm not here to talk about that. So for me, it's more of a, a way of life, just living a really wholesome and a kind life, not being fake nice like a lot of people in Alabama are where I live. <laughs> Mm. But actually being an authentic nice right. and really being an individual first, taking care of your own responsibilities and understanding that you're responsible for your actions is very left hand path. Yes. So you do that before you go out there and you take it out to a community. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's, we were talking beforehand a little bit about Anton LaVey and that, that was the stuff I liked from Anton LaVey was that whole be responsible for your actions, you know, that, that whole, you know, sense of that, which just seems common sense to me, but isn't to a lot of people. It's much easier just to blame it off on, on something else like demons or whatever. Um, the devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. Exactly. <laughs> First of all, that kind of devil doesn't exist. <laughs> You know, so the, the, the schism that they do there in their own brain is just, it's insane. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And to some people, everything unexplained is just demons, and and it's a very easy um, it's a very easy thing to coat everything with, and then you don't have to worry about contradictions because it's just all one thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's that's so correct. Yeah, you're right. So anyway, go so, go ahead. Yeah, I guess if I want to just throw some sources out, like academic or scholarly sources, if if your listeners would like to check out, um, and and, and these are going to be historic. So if you love history, if you just love reading history or philosophy. Check out these books, The Darkening Age by Catherine Nixie, and that's recommended by Noam Chomsky. Mm. The Myth of Persecution by Candida Moss and Lords of the Left Hand Path by Stephen Flowers. Okay. And all three of these people, they are academics. They have researched this stuff for years. You've probably heard if you listen to any interviews with Lucian Greaves, spokesperson person for the satanic temple he actually recommends he's i've heard him say it twice lords of the left-hand path yeah because it really do does explain the sense of a left-hand path and 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 the actual and what it actually is not what the propaganda of a right-hand path put upon it and if if you're thinking about this rationally and logically there's actually a place for both like it's it's a false dichotomy to say you have to choose either or right because the left hand path is more about individuality you know being self you know responsible and all that jazz but the left hand or the right hand path excuse me the right hand path is about community and being communal and that sense of being a part of a whole and we can see how both of those things can work hand in hand because you are both the wave and the ocean you're both an individual and you're a, you're a member of a group of individuals that are living in a civilized society or so we hope yeah we can hope yes <laughs> <laughs> but we can also see how each of those could go very dark very quickly. You know, people, when, when people are too much about the eye, the eye, that's when you get into the, the really, the really over the top hedonism yeah. and selfishness. When people are all about the group, that's when you get into really bad communes. You know, we could look at the Soviet history. Um, that's when that's when you really get into cults. Yeah. And that's when people start burning witches. I've also felt like like I, it was I don't remember who said it at this point, but someone had said that the left hand path is indulgence, the right hand path is abstinence, and it might have been in relation to like right and left hand path tantra as well. Is it may have been where that came from? Yeah, I, I I'm not too familiar with tantra, but I have studied it just a little bit here in passing. But it's not it's not something I practice necessarily. Right. I guess mine would be more philosophical and uh, looking at it through more of a um, I, I, I guess, and I've studied Zen Buddhism, Taoism a bit, and even though I'm not a Buddhist Taoist, 
And I have a lot of appreciation for those things, but actually just looking at it in very, you know, atheistic philosophies of Western philosophy, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess animism, more indigenous animism, where yes, everything is alive and we all have energy. That means everything's an eye, you know, and, and living on a mountain that, you know, was a sacred place to two tribes, Mus Muscogee Creek and Cherokee, and feeling the energy here, like understanding the rocks here hold a lot. And this being a mountain that's actually Nakalula is known for it, its its suicides. Like this is the legend is of a suicide, and it's named after a princess who committed suicide. Mm. And people here come here to commit suicide. Please don't come here to commit suicide. I'm, maybe we should have said a trigger warning, but. <laughs> Um, yeah, so Nakalula is, 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 there's a lot of heavy energy here and I, and I got off track talking about that. I apologize. So, so, so is it kind but of like I, the, the suicide forest in Japan? It's not quite that bad. No, not, okay. not near, not near, but, but you know, it's, 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 it's a heaviness and, uh, it's interesting because about three different ecosystems meet in North Alabama. If you've ever listened to that podcast, the defensive plant. Um, they always talk about how North Alabama is one of the, well, Alabama in general is one of the top five states for biodiversity. Really? I think the only, the only two that beat us out, California and Texas. And I know this because I'm into gardening and I'm a naturalist and, and all this stuff. And my husband, he's actually, you know, chair of a science department. So we're very much into, um, just nature and stuff like that. Right. So, and, and my backyard's a meadow. <laughs> I made my backyard a meadow that I cultivate every Every uh, summer, I have nice. a pollinator meadow for wildfire flowers. So, and I love to garden. Hmm. But I, but sorry, <laughs> I could talk okay. about plants. But we're not here. We're not here to talk about plants. <laughs> Getting back to what I was going to say about these three books, I'm sorry about that. You may have That's to just okay. that. But um, I think that just to go through some quick history, um, and and I'll and I'll just read through my notes really fast and and kind of go over early Christians. You know, they, we had these early Christians called Desert Fathers, and they were these these ascetic bands of basically angry young men or psychopaths, whatever you want to call it. And the equivalent would be basically the equivalent we see today would have been or would be ISIS. Okay. They were religious zealots and they destroyed the classical world. And that's this is one. And this is just history for those of you guys who didn't take world history. And I know in states like Alabama, it's not required. <laughs> so that's sad. <laughs> But um, these religious zealots are the reasons that we have missing gaps in our art and our history and our literature. Yeah. And eventually the Desert Fathers were actually when the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, became the state religion of Rome in 300 and something AD under Constantine. They took in these Desert Fathers, fathers, and I'm saying that with quotes because that's really being way too generous. I mean, these were basically terrorists. Right. And they would go into places and whole communities and they they were today we would call them anti-semitic they persecuted the jews they persecuted so many different groups even of other different christian groups like the cathars various gnostic groups that were around at this time right and they became the henchmen of the roman catholic church the early church and they are famously responsible or infamously responsible for the murder and torture of hypatia of alexandra of alexandra and the and the burning of the library of alexandra so that is how dark the right hand path can get right there's an example of that energy that ferocious frenetic hatred and I would say evil that can take over when you get a group think that's so bent on demonizing and yeah. they demonize knowledge. They demonize women because they don't understand how women can bring forth life and, and they demonize other peoples because they don't like the way they think and they and they reside outside what they see as orthodoxy. Yeah. And when the orthodoxy wants to get rid of the other, the other with a capital O, their modus operandi is to demonize. And when you demonize people, it makes it okay to kill them, to murder them, right, and right. To, to commit genocide. And that's wrong. I think everyone would agree that's wrong. Yeah. It's just, so, it, it's something, it's something that too, you know, like our culture today is so good at demonizing uh, mm -hmm. certain groups. I mean, because we know the psychology behind this now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's something like we never learn these lessons. Like why humans, can you not just learn? Why can you not just learn? I, I, I have a saying, and, and I've said this for years and I think I heard it on some cable TV show, but all monsters are human. Yeah. And it's just all monsters to me are human. Like I don't look at goetic spirits. I don't look at, at, you know, unicorns or chimeras or dragons or whatever 
you know, religious or mythological creature you want to talk about, I don't look at them as being evil, you know, because A, because I'm not sure if they're real or not, they're probably not, but, you know, I'm not going to say I believe in something. But the thing is, I do know humans are real. I don't know if I believe in humans either, but I know humans are real. And I see the very monstrous acts that humans do. And 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 I think, go ahead, I'm sorry. That's okay. I've said repeatedly, like, you know, like when something weird happens around me, it's kind of like, I hope that's not a person. Like, Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, the weird poltergeisty stuff, that's fine. That doesn't, you know, I don't feel threatened by that stuff. But if someone was breaking into my house, that I'd feel threatened by. Oh, most definitely. Mm-hmm. I, 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 can, I completely understand that feeling. It, I it, think that, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, it's the people that are scary, not, not so much the paranormal stuff. Yeah, I, I don't, I, you know, it's so normal for that stuff to happen around me that I just don't, if I know it's, it's just, I can't explain it. I'm like, oh, okay, that's just, that's just that again. But if I think <laughs> it's, it's a person doing something weird, that's when I get terrified. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Especially being, being a woman, you know, especially right. being a woman at this any time, really. But I think one thing that is very clear is that through history, if if you're looking out at history objectively, as objective as you can, like, I don't know if anything's fully objective, but outside of a church school, mm-hmm. if you're looking at history outside of like a religious institution, before the institution of a state-ordained religion, Rome was actually very tolerant of all religions and gods and philosophies of various different types, uh, because Rome was basically the center of learning and civilization, and Rome was quite proud of this. They didn't it's not that they punished Christians for being Christians. That that was part of the lie told. They punished Christians for breaking the law mm. because Christians were a very new, very frenetic, very loud group. And they were breaking the law. They were committing acts of terrorism against the state, you know? And it's not any it's not that their belief system was oh so offensive offensive to the Romans. I mean, the Romans had crazy gods and crazy stories about their gods. I mean, Zeus and all the fairies he had and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's just, but I think that uh, there, especially where I live, there's this this great myth, myth of persecution where everything that the right hand path people have done, they project it onto other people, like whether it's, it's domestic violence or being cruel to animals or hurting yeah. children. That's that's in their churches. That's in their schools. That's yeah. in their church school. That's in their culture. And that's in their families. And that's scary. And any of us who grew up Catholic or went to Catholic school, a lot of us probably saw this firsthand yeah unfortunately the 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 ability to project your own evil crimes onto other people is just not something that i can overlook or forgive up from the right hand path yeah like the great defamation and demonizing that they've done to everybody else is not something that's that i'm ever going to be able to forgive because it is unforgivable that's why they you know they have to make up conspiracy theories and, and such like that and put it off on other people because they don't want to look in the mirror because if they looked in the mirror they'd see the monster is actually them. Agreed. And uh, luckily I was not re- raised overly religious. I think I may have gone to church once. Um, and my, pa- and my, par- my parents, my grandparents were very religious, but my parents never particularly seemed to care. Um, they considered themselves Christians, but never really did anything about it, you know? Um, mm-hmm. But like le- going through historical stuff, when I started learning the history of Christianity and stuff, I was just kind of like, man, they, they have committed some of the worst atrocities of, of anyone out there. Of any, yeah. you know, I mean, the number, the blood on, on, you know, during the witch burnings and uh, the torture and all that stuff, I mean, it was just unreal. And I, and I sort of developed sort of an anti-Christian sort of view of it where I was just like, well, Christians are bad. And over time, I've met so many good Christians, like actual good Christians, where I'm like, okay, I'm clearly painting this, this with a, a, a very broad brush. Like the history may be bad and there is always going to be bad people in every group. But now at least I could say I know a good number of Christians who are very good people. Like, and so I don't have that, that sort of antipathy I had for it for a bit. Um, but yeah, the history is very, very dark. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And, and I, and I think I don't have any answers for them. I think they're going to have to save their own religion because I, I'm certainly not a member of it. So, you know, they, that they, they have to realize this themselves and put a stop to it. And, you know, I, I hope that that happens, but I'm not going to hold my breath. I, I, I do think that to paraphrase Lord's uh, line from Lords of the Left Hand Path, I think that evil is the distant after- aftershock of the witch hunts and the inquisitions that continue to ruin lives. There's a really good documentary called Satan Wants You, and it talks about the satanic panic of the 1980s and 1990s mm-hmm. and how 
this one book Michelle remembers started all of that. And it was very contrived. Like, like they, they knew, they knew it was BS, what they were doing, what they were selling. And they put it out there. People went to jail. People's yeah. lives were destroyed for decades yep. because of and, and these bizarre just lies. And the weird thing is, and, and I remember when I was watching this documentary, I had to pause it because this is the sta- same stuff I read that was that was basically that witches were accused of in the Middle Ages, witches and Jews and the whole blood libel tropes. It's so horrendous that people still use to this day. And, and we've seen this crop up again in, in recent times, a few years back with conspiracy theories. So I don't think we ever made it out of the satanic panic. In fact, I don't think we're clear of the burning times. I think we always have to check ourselves and we always have to make sure to shine a light onto this and say, is, is this logical? Is this rational? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's and, a very good point. You also had and, hypnosis mixed up on that in the, in the eighties satanic panic stuff too, where they were supposedly oh yeah. recovering memories when they were really just traumatizing these kids by creating oh. memories. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's, that, that's another thing is that the hypnosis that still goes on a day in psychology, especially in areas like Alabama, where psychology is behind about 20 years. <laughs> like you cannot find a reliable psychologist. Like the people we have here are still very much pray the gay out of people. Yeah. Like I, I am really in a time warp. I mean, I'm, I'm in a different, I'm, I'm in a different decade than the rest of y'all. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's very, it's very difficult to live here. It, I'm, I'm, I, there's no way I can sugarcoat it and say, I don't know those nice Christians you talk about. In fact, I may know a couple. I, I have a decent neighbor, but she just, she doesn't like get diarrhea of the mouth and talk about all this stuff. She right, can just right. go on and, and be a decent person, you know, exactly. and just talk about something else. Yeah, and, and I find a lot of, I've met a lot of people who consider themselves Christian, but are not, they're more like spiritual Christians. They're not as dogmatic. And mm-hmm. I don't know if that's something that, that's only happened in the last like 10 years or so, but I, I know a bunch of people who kind of consider themselves like they, they, they sort of believe in the teachings, but they're not specifically dogmatic about it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and maybe that's, that's going to be the ne- next step to where they sort of have like the spirituality and maybe a step further, they'll actually one day be like non-theistic Christians, maybe. but that's up to them. I mean, yeah. I don't, I don't know how that can evolve. They've got to write their own story, you yeah. know? Yeah. And everyone has different needs out of those spiritual, out of spirituality as well. So it does scare me when they say things like, when they say things like, oh, well, if I didn't have the Bible, I think I'd be a worse person than what I am. And I'm yes. like, really? You need to you need that to tell you not to rape and kill people like that. Like you, you just don't know not to do that. Like, obviously to me, evolutionary biology tells us that it's actually cooperation, not competition. That's why we're here today. Yeah. You know, we understand don't call suffering. Suffering equals not good. Suffering is bad. Don't call suffering. And that's just cosmic being, having some sort of cosmic, I guess, cosmic morality is what I call it. Yeah. Yeah. That works. But, you know, and and on the, I mean, on the topic of good and evil, the way that evil has been defined in the classical world, especially in the Middle Ages, is quite different than the the humanistic definition that we have of evil today. Like, like if we were to go out there and use the word evil in the vernacular, we would take the word evil to mean something like, well, genocide is evil, or murdering people, that's evil, or stealing from people, that's evil, right? And it certainly is true to me, I would call that, I, I would call that a type of cosmic morality, but the early church actually and took evil to mean more of a dogmatic type of uh, rules or doctrines, such as evil was synonymous with having forbidden knowledge. Yeah. And the Judeo-Christian re- religions in particular, evil means knowledge. It doesn't mean, you know, don't call suffering because they're the God, the character Yahweh, the maniacal psychopath who's uberly jealous of everybody and every other God or gods, whatever. Like he goes out and, and destroys whole entire populations and floods the world and it yeah. instructs people to make sacrifices to him and all this other nonsense. So evil had a very different definition back then or in that mythos, not back then. I don't know how, I don't think any of that's factual, but that mythology, Judeo Christian mythology, evil basically is knowledge, especially in Genesis, forbidden yeah. knowledge. Yeah. And the serpent is the light bringer. And of course, you know, you just mentioned Gnostics, didn't you? And that's that's very much fundamental to Gnostic Christianity, where it's kind of all turned on its head. And yeah. Gnostic Christianity is very much a form of left hand path. Yeah, I guess I never thought about them as left hand path, but that's true. Yeah, the Catholics, even though they were ascetics too, they were very left hand path. And uh 
I actually, in undergrad, I, I eventually my major was public administration under poli sci, <laughs> the opposite of business administration. But I started out as a religion philosophy major, and I and I read a lot of the Gnostic stuff, and I and I remember thinking, this sounds like Satanism. <laughs> <laughs> And, and it does, it has a lot of the same, I guess, ideas and notions as Satanism, some, some sat- satanic beliefs. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and none of these things are a hundred percent like everyone who, you know, like everyone who considers themselves a Satanist obviously doesn't think the same way. Everyone who considers themselves Christian doesn't think the same way. And I'm sure yeah. the Gnostics had different, different branches between, I mean, cause no one experiences the world the same way. That's the thing. Mm-hmm. That's, that's very true. You know, it's, it's all through through viewpoints. Yeah. And and experiences. And, you know, if you have bad experiences repeatedly with a certain type of person, you might, you know, feel it's okay to like hate that type of person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and that, and I think that's where education and being a light bringer, being an educator, <laughs> yeah. being a light bringer, that's, that's the modern day form of being a light bringer, offering that knowledge, that knowledge to clear all those misunderstandings and mispreconceived notions and all that stuff up. And, you know, we, we see it in the mythology, you know, we got Morningstar, Lilith, Prometheus, Pandora, Hecate, we've got examples from Sumer and Egypt. And we, we, we see these, these collect these stories, these archetypes in the collective unconsciousness about light bringers and, and bringing knowledge to try to snap us out of this, this cycle. Yeah. And I, I always think, and, and I, and I forget if I said it, while we were recording or if it was earlier where I talked about the left hand and the right hand path, like the individual meeting the, the communal yeah. yep. Yep. and you th- did. Th- there's definitely a need for both. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's incredibly important for people to, uh, to understand themselves, to, to be who mm-hmm. they are and, and to do that takes, you know, some sense of individuality at the same time that doesn't isolate us from being able to connect with other people and and help other people while still being ourselves it's just a matter of accepting people for who they are mhm yeah which doesn't yeah, sound and, that and hard but it is it, for it, a it, lot of people it is yeah, yeah it, it is even for those of us who tend to try our damned sorry try try our darndest to be open minded <laughs> It, it, it can still be hard because, you know, we are coming from from a, a point of view of a certain life experience. We are coming from our own biases. Yeah. You know, I, I look at things. I look at everything out as coming from my my 20th century childhood of being a girl in the American South, you know, where we moved from the Smoky Mountains to a sundown town in the 1990. Actually, it was 1989. A sundown town. There was still sundown town. There were still sundown towns in 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 the 1990s in Alabama. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't and, even and know. Moved- I didn't know those existed until I watched Lovecraft Country, and they had an episode about one. Oh, 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 they, they, there's still some places I guarantee, I guarantee you today. You could say damn, damn's fine. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And the, the terrifying thing is I don't think, I don't think Coleman is any better, but the name of the town's Coleman and it's, it's not too far away. It's in North Alabama too, but it's just this tiny place. And they had that sign. If you've watched Lovecraft Country, that sign, they had that sign in Coleman. And that when we lived there, it was rumored to be in the museum. And um, But we moved. I was about, I was going on 12. And I moved to this town, this very small town from East Tennessee, which back in the day was pretty enlightened compared to other places in the American South. And there's only one type of person in this town that I moved to. And I have never felt that that ever present evil. I mean, the, the only way I know how to describe it is evil. I mean, and it was oppressive and they were all Christian. They're most of them Protestant, but there was a small Catholic community, which that's where we were. And it, it was just, I mean, the things these people would say and do, I mean, they, I have, I have never seen, I don't ever want to live. And, and I, and the whole South has become that. And it, it breaks my heart. It, it, it breaks a piece of your soul to know that these people are still there. I mean, these people that I'm only 46 and there's, they, they still believe this. Yeah. There are still people who, that try to make Coleman a sundown County, actually the entire, but the thing is, is that during 
I think it's 2015, 2016, the Klan was actually handing out, they were putting out um, little pamphlets and, and with little um, little gift bags and putting candy in there for kids, like little coloring things for kids. Mm. The Klan, were, they were putting those all over gas stations in wow. Coleman County. And I had a friend who still lived there and she went, she took a picture of a couple of them and said, okay, this is where they're at. Um, beware. But at that point, Coleman was just not a sundown town. It was seat of the clan. Mm. And, and, and that's, that's a reality that those people are still with us. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yes, all monsters are human. <laughs> Um, or we make the things that are other, uh, monsters. Yes. And, and that happens too, like commonly, yeah. like I, to these people, I was the monster, right? Right. Cause right. I was a strange little girl. I was the monster. I wasn't a goth kid. I was an a conduct student, but I was different. Mm. I, as I was growing up, as I became more and more of a metalhead. Um, there were numerous parents who just assumed I was a troublemaker that I was going to get their kids into drugs and I was anti-drug. I drank a little when I was under 21, but I was like, I was the one that was trying to get, you know, my friends not to do things. Yeah, but, I understand that. But they would look mm-hmm. at me and be like, you know, oh, you have long hair and, you know, you're wearing these weird shirts and you're, you're a troublemaker. You must be a druggie. You must be this. You must be that. And I'd just be like, this is so ironic. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the ones who point the finger. And, and I've seen that all my life. It's, it's the ones who make up lies, just these rabid lies where they get people hurt. Yeah. They're the ones who are doing that. They're the ones who are hurting children. They're the ones who are, you know, torturing animals. They're the ones who are doing all these very malicious, just acts of cruelty that are unthinkable. And that is what my life has shown me and has taught me. Yeah. Um, I do want to get into some of your experiences. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I don't know if you want to work this into to everything you have here. Yeah. Um. I, I guess. Sure. I, I'll just say. You know the the word demon real quick. And I know your listeners probably know this if they've listened to anyone talk about goetics. The Greek daemon. Um. It means deity or divine power. Yeah. Lesser god, guiding spirit, and the term demon really gets negative when you get into the Greek Christian translations or the Vulgate Bible. And you guys know what the Vulgate Bible is, I'm sure. I don't. And actually. that's what. Yeah. It 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 takes on a very negative a negative connotation. So so t- tell me a little bit about that Bible. The Vulgate is basically the Latin Bible. Okay. Um, okay. very th- think about it like early Catholic Bible. And I'm, and that's a very fast, quick definition. I ha- remember I haven't studied this stuff since Catholic school, but, um, <laughs> I, I I don't I don't like Latin as a language. I did study it a little bit, but I'm, it's just not something I use. I, I try to avoid Latin. Understandable. So, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't have good fuzzy warm connotations or, or feelings for me. <laughs> so it just doesn't. But um, so I guess typically typically today Christians would think demons are fallen angels or some brand of I don't know like either Morning Stars angels or the Watchers in the Book of Enoch. Right. And I, I've always said, I think the difference between an angel and a devil is just their, or demon rather, is just their alignment. Like whether someone believes they're aligned to good or bad, so-called good or evil in, in quotes. <laughs> yeah. And, and I've always used the example of like a cat, you know, to, to us, that cat is a good, cute little creature, but to, to a mite, to a mouse, that's like the ultimate evil. Yeah. Unless they're, you're one of those cats that like to carry the chipmunk around like a baby, like one of my cats. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are those two. Yeah. But if you're a mouse and you see that cat bearing down on you, that's, that's you know, the, the mouse equivalent of a demon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I suppose it is all about perspective. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I, I love demons and I love cats, so I guess I'll always take their side. And see, that's that's my biases, right? Like, it's because those are the people who have had me. Right. So. All right. So, so what what do you want me to to, to tell or talk about in particular with a, a experience with a well, what what, what, what were your uh, yeah? I mean, were you practicing magic at the time? Uh, yeah, I, I not not what you're thinking though. Not not that dude bro goetic high magic stuff. Okay. <laughs> not not the Crowley stuff. What I do is quite different, okay. and I I don't. For example, it's not structured like that. I'm not disrespectful. I don't yell and curse at things. I I think of it more as communing with nature and more of like a animistic approach. And I certainly would not imagine calling if there was an actual being calling it down to a triangle and threatening it. And those of you out there who do high magic, you know what I'm speaking of. 
right? I, I just, what you put into the supernatural is, is exactly what you're going to get out of it. it. That's just my experience. Like if you're being all freaky and creepy and trying to look for a big baddie and you have really just bad intentions, that's what you're going to get. If if you're looking for something else, if, if you're looking at it, because maybe you've always known it. In my case, I've always known it. If you're seeing it as protection or as a protector or as enlightenment Mm -hmm. or as just a friend, um, that's what you're going to get. And and even the most uh, unpleasant paranormal experiences I've had, I always look at them as, what was this trying to teach me? I've never looked at them as, oh, that was evil. That was trying to hurt me. It's like, no, what was this teaching me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and that's, I've, I've had a couple that I kind of put me on pause for a minute where I was like, okay, why did you freak me out like that? But right. then I realized, I realized I had someone in my life that it wanted, that they wanted out of my life. Oh, okay. And, and, and I'll, and I'll just talk about this briefly, this one instance. And, and remember, like a lot of this happens in that liminal space between waking up and going to sleep Yeah. and where you're, where, where you know that you're going lucid but I'll still sit up in bed and be able to move around and there'll still be a presence, sometimes a 3D opaque form <laughs> mm. with me. And I don't know that's rare. And I know that may sound crazy. And hey, maybe it's just a brain fart. After all, I am an atheist. <laughs> I, I'm i not going to sit here and define something and I'm not going to make claims because this is also what I say. You cannot apply logic to anecdotal experiences. Yeah. Just take it as your experience. And just sit with it and just be with it and it, let it be what that means for you. You can't go around convincing people. You're not getting any divine message to tell the world (laughs) necessarily. And I don't know, maybe it is a brain fart, but I, one time there was a person who I had gone to high school with. And remember, I went to this weird Catholic high school in Coleman, Alabama, that it was a scandal and I left high school two years early. And I basically, in a nutshell, this, this, this school is called St. Bernard. And they are known for some of their scandals. Um, I had a, f- a classmate who had an affair with a monk. It was a homosexual affair. So I left Coleman two years early and started college early and went back to Tennessee. And I dropped everybody that was in that town and that school just from circumstances. And this person was someone who one of the only people, she was one of the only people that I kept in contact with from this school. But her family was also from Coleman. So they are actual Coleman Knights. And they were some of the only people that were decent to my family when we were there. So I'll give them credit for that. But she, sometime in her 30s, found me, again, got in contact with me. And we just started chatting and talking. And this is when my husband and I, we lived in Birmingham. And she came to visit a couple of times. And long story short, she started to have some personal things going wrong in her life. Like, it turned out her husband was cheating on her and they had a bad divorce and all this other stuff. So I had always kind of been a big sister character to this person, to this this girl, mm-hmm. a woman now in her 30s. And she looked to me again and I helped her find an attorney, one of my friends, to represent her. And she was able to spend a couple weekends with us. But as it went on, I was also having health issues like that would lead to me having a hysterectomy a couple of years ago in my early 40s. I had three surgeries. Long story short, I had three surgeries within that year. And yeah, it it, it was intense. And she was having all these personal issues in the midst of me having these surgeries. And one was a myomectomy where they had to go in and they had to cut tumors off of my uterus. (laughs) Sorry, guys, but that that. That's a thing. Sure. And uh, she got to where she just didn't understand boundaries. And I was so sick. I could physically not really hold it together, like to really move around the house. And I and, and I can't take I can't take pain medication. I'm, I'm highly allergic to narcotics, any like opioids or anything like that. So I basically just have to take um, really strong like ibuprofen or something. And, and I can't take that because <laughs> my stomach's sensitive to that. So basically, I just deal with pain. That's just huh. that's just what I do. <laughs> I have a very high tolerance. So um, she was just being very selfish and weird. And long story short, I started, I hadn't really had a lot of spiritual happenings or anything going on through all this. You know, it had kind of before a lot of my health issues kind of blew up. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd been able to do yoga and practice witchcraft and all these lovely things. And but when my physical health and the, the issues got really out of whack, basically, that's when 
life was just on hold for me. And I didn't realize that this person was taking advantage of me and my kindness and and also my husband's patience because my husband was about done with it. He was done with her. He could not stand her. And she would just show up. And I had always been a person of good boundaries and someone who's very able to say no. But because I was in so much pain, I, I a lot of things just were not registering. And I started to have like they started to become pretty prominent and they started to do it for me to, to kick her out. She one night when she spent the night, she had these horrible dogs, these two chihuahuas that she would not keep in a kennel. And for some reason, we told her she could bring them over. Mm. And we have house cats that are not allowed outside. And at the time, we had a couple house rabbits and these we'd have to move everyone in the bedroom where I was. And we were basically walled up in this bedroom while this, you know what, was just laid up on our couch because she was so distraught she couldn't go home. Yeah. Well, one night when, when she crashed at her place with these two obnoxious dogs and, and they were sweet dogs, they would mind me, but she didn't she didn't make them behave. And she was spending the night one night and. She woke up and she said she saw this figure as tall as the ceiling. And we had tall ceilings that was looming in the doorway of the living room that had walked out of my bedroom and was staring at her. Mm. Just a solid black figure just staring at her. And she said that scared the poop out of her. And she got the intense feeling to leave. And she started to just see this person when she was taking advantage. And I wasn't doing anything. It's not like, you know, I was calling anything up or anything. But and in the midst of this. I was trying to keep, I was, I basically told her to just not come around because she, her, her life was a mess and I don't want to go into that, but she, she is a Colmanite and it's, I have since learned that there's nothing good that comes out of a Colmanite other than drama. And I, uh, I woke up one night and I had, I saw (laughs) one of them hanging, one of the goetic spirits hanging from a noose in my bathroom that was across from my bed and he was hanging there and I was and it really freaked me out I was like what the f are you doing yeah and he turns slowly and looks at me with his head cocked and he grins this this grin he comes and slides right across the ceiling where he's staring standing over me and looking down at me and he's hanging from that noose and that's the one time that they really freaked me out. But it freaked, I freaked me out so bad that I just passed out because I, I was awake. I was fully awake. I'd gone to the bathroom and everything. And I woke up and I thought about that. And it, it it's almost like it just, it came to me like, like that. This person, this girl who'd been just randomly crashing at our house during all these health issues of mine and draining me of energy, she was just a parasite. She was a psychic vampire who causes her own problems. And I had, I don't know how I'd forgotten this, but back in her early 20s, she had tried to commit suicide. Mm. And she went through this period where she was really showy and and one of those girls who talks about her suicidal impulses and all this stuff. And um, she was still carrying that energy really heavy in her. And I was so sick that that's what she was coming over and dumping in me because she would leave recharged talking about how great of a person of a friend I was. And, and, I, didn't, and I didn't even see her that many times. It was just a handful of times that she did this. And I know it sounds like a lot, me retelling it, but it was only about maybe five to six times. That's enough. And I, it is enough. You're right. But my husband had finally, I mean, he, he, he kicked her out. He, he had words with her and kicked her out and told her never to contact me again because it got to the point where he said, well, I know exactly. And he's a physicist. So my husband's very logical. He's, 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 he doesn't, you know, he's, he's not a witch or anything like that. He said, well, I know exactly what they're trying to tell you. She's dumping this suicidal energy on you and you're sick. Yeah. She's inadvertently trying to kill you. They're like, they're telling you, get this up out of your house right now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's, and, 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 and that, that was, that's, that's the time that really freaked me out. They really, that's the only time they really freaked me out though. Mm. is because I I just, and it was because I was so sick that I just, I was saying no, but that no was not being respected. Right, right. Oh. I know that's weird. That sounds like. <laughs> it's it's not that weird. Not to me anyway. <laughs> um, but that's very, very kind of like on point for what they're try, trying to do. I mean, showing themselves to her, uh, appearing is kind of terrifying. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not subtle, okay. I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, and. But they, they, they have never, they've never led me astray or hurt me yeah. or they've never really hurt anybody that I know of. I mean, they, the, the thing is, they're just, I, I think wherever, you know, we, we, we have these 3d brains and we're trying to function in the fourth dimension and we've got these little 3d brains, right? Yeah. And I think wherever they are, if they are outside, if they're like non-local to us, to our brains, 
I think sometimes they, they're like, what the hell are y'all doing? <laughs> Get it together. You know, and, and I, and I think that frustration with me being, having been in the past way too kind, um, I, I think that's another reason why they were always there because I don't think they like it when kind people get really taken advantage of. Mm. And and I know that sounds, and I know that that sounds, may sound the antithesis of what people think when they think of a goetic spirit or a demon or whatever they want to call it. But uh, that's been my reality with them. How, how, how did you like, how do, how do you uh, assign them as goetic spirits? Like what, what makes you think they're goetic and not something else? What they tell me. Oh, okay. Um, they are very clear. I, I, I don't feel like I should say too much because I don't really have a right to. That's I'm not fine. one of these people who's going to write a book or, or tell you what to do or betray their trust. Right. Because these, these are, these are my family. The, I mean, these are my people. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I think, and, and maybe it's all in my head. Maybe it is just all local to my brain. Right. Maybe it's my bicameral mind. Well, but, if it is, it's projecting outwards as well. Mm-hmm. Oh, most definitely. Most definitely. But this is the atheistic part of me, the part of me <laughs> that made an AM in logic. Right. This is this part of me talking. And again, this is we, we could use this, you know, you know, this this is the logical half. <laughs> right. This is this is, you know. Not, not my emotional brain. This is my logical brain. And in order for them to function and be healthy, they they both have to be in conversation with each other. Yeah. Some people would call it the feminine and the masculine, whatever you want to call it. Right. It's the same thing. Balance. Balance is incredibly mm-hmm. important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, whether this stuff comes from within us or without us, uh, like it's it's a real thing. I mean, this is this is kind of my 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 statement about this show is that whatever these things are, these experiences, they're they've been with us throughout time, recorded history across culture. I mean, it, they they have different masks, but right. there's something there. Whether it just be us, a human experience uh, that we don't understand, or something else outside of us that's communicating with us, it's like it, they're still real in some way. Yeah, yeah, and I totally get that. I, I'm not a materialist. I, I wouldn't want anyone out there to confuse and conflate, you know, materialism with atheism because. Atheism, atheist is just a negation, yeah. right? What you're not. Like, I'm not a theist. Right. It's just a negation. So, I'm not a materialist either, though. I, I don't think everything's just made of, like, matter and that's it. I think there are other things out there that we don't know how to measure. Yeah. And I think there's things that it's very possible we just don't know how to perceive this stuff. We don't have the capability. So, mm-hmm. it, yeah. you know, our the way our brain works, it's, it's interpreting stuff. And I... I've said this a lot, like, especially when you get like these weird one-off monster encounters. Um, so someone mm-hmm. might be wandering through the woods and they encounter this, this piece of consciousness that it can't interpret. It has, it goes, it flips through its Rolodex. The brain flips through its Rolodex. It goes, what is this? Well, I don't know what this is. And things I don't know are scary. What else is scary? Mm-hmm. Monsters. Right. It must, must be a monster. <laughs> right. Right. And, and. I I try really hard not to do that, but you know, it's, I think it's been easier for me than most because I, I didn't stop seeing, I, I didn't have that point in my life where I stopped seeing the imaginary friends, you know, so-called the imaginary friends. Right. And, you know, I've had one that followed me for a long time through childhood. And I think I understand why that was. And um, I think that that's, that's not unusual. I just, think we don't talk about it. And I don't think that we should be afraid to talk about these things. I, I don't think that we should, whether it's 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 the materialist or the church or churches, I don't think we should allow them to shut us up and to define these things for us. You you it's it's your anecdotal experience. Yeah. And the thing is you can make whatever rules you want for yourself, but that doesn't mean anyone else has to abide by them. Right, right. And and, and that's correct because you know someone who like for instance I've they they don't always look human. And I think when things don't look perfectly human, or maybe they're trying to be too perfectly human and you get into the uncanny valley phenomenon, I think people get really freaked out. And I think that's what puts a lot of people off is that it's it's, it's not the familiar. Yeah. Yeah. Now, have you had, I mean, like, like in stuff you've seen, how, how not human has this stuff looked to you? I mean, I've seen, I've seen everything from things that would look like Um, I don't want to sound goofy, but like, you know, like a, like a, I want to say a modern, like a tall, um, what people would, would, I don't even know how to describe it, but I guess I could physically describe it as humanoid. Okay. Um, maybe not, I don't want to use the word elf because everyone's going to think like fantasy Lord of the Rings and all that stuff, but 
Definitely that, that, the ears and just mixtures of just, just an alien. We'll just say alien, but okay. not, not, I'm not grays or anything like that. I don't know what people are seeing there and I don't know what that is, but the things I've seen have been quite, maybe it's just unique to me or maybe it's just, and, and I've seen things that, you know, do look very, um, naturey, <laughs> naturey. I think I made up a word. <laughs> very, very earth, earth spirit. Very, very. Um, if you're talking about like a Treeland spirit, or I've seen things that are that you may classify as angelic, <laughs> which would be the same thing as demonic. Right. I've seen, I've seen the tall shadow figures. I've seen the the ones that everyone talks about. They're scared of with the with the the broad shoulders. That to me, that's not scary. But okay. <laughs> um, I, I I find that comforting. See, and that's how different the aesthetics are. Yes. Oh well, yeah, absolutely. And I mean. Even angels, I mean, in the Bible, angels were terrifying. Right, right. And and, and I've, I've seen stuff that when people talk about that is kind of like that, but I try not to put my own, my own um, projections onto it. I try just to sort of look at it and go, do you really look like that? Or is that just me just putting what I think I should see or what I want to see or something like that? Yeah. Because, you know, it's just, and plus, you know, I grew up watching Star Trek. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> if anything, Star Trek was the closest thing to religion. So when I, I think about this stuff, I just think about it like an alien. Like right. I'm not thinking of, you know, maybe that's out there in the mythos now. Or that's our cultural, or, you know, that, that that's in our culture. It's, it's, it's all just alien lands where it used to be angels but um i i just it sounds i don't want to sound cheesy or hokey or anything but it just it i don't know i just i mean sometimes you know you get the the tropes like i've i've seen the 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 solid black eyed people um the tall ones and okay. i've i've seen that and they don't like the really the ones where you know in horror movies they try to make them look demonic and stuff like that but that, when they're there, they're usually trying to bring in a message like, okay, girl, bring your A game because mm. these people are at the door and we're going to war. And and I know I talked to you a little bit about my human rights campaign I was on and all that jazz. But um, I, so it's always been positive regardless of what it looks like. I guess that's why I don't put so much emphasis on looks because everything everyone else says is scary. I'm like, and, <laughs> you know. <laughs> right, right. Uh, we do have uh, to take a quick break, and uh, we okay. will be right back. All right, quick mid-show break here. And uh, first of all, contact info. Everything can be found at wheredidtheroadgo.com. So just head over there. You can click the contact link, and you'll find emails for everything. And uh, you can message me right through the website as well. There's a little pop-up that shows up and allows you to message me. So, uh, But email is usually a little more reliable. Anyway. Uh, all the shows are there, all the way back to the beginning, all our social media, Discord, Facebook, X, Reddit, everything. Everything can be found there, Where did the road go com, And, of course, if you want to become a patron, it's only $3 a month, and you get extra content pretty much every week, as well as the shows a week early, and some extra special stuff thrown in on a fairly regular basis. Um, all right, so, also, if you like heavy music, Check out my music show, The Last Exit for the Lost. You can find that at thelastexit.org. Um, it's weekly. It's really long. It's like six and a half hours long every week. And we have live bands. We have a lot of really obscure stuff, good obscure stuff um, that we play on a regular basis. And it's all, not all, but a lot of it's archived at thelastexit.org. So go check it out there if you're interested. Now, as far as a recommendation, I kind of hesitated on this one, and I and I realized I really like the podcast. It's called Tower Four. I don't think I've mentioned it before. It's not amazing, but it's intriguing. And uh, I don't know exactly how far he's gotten on it. He started it in 2020, and there have been some pretty big gaps. But he just he's uh, I believe about halfway through season three now, and it's about a guy who's in a fire watchtower out in the Midwest somewhere, and he uh, has weird stuff going on in the forest around him. And there's some suspicious human activity and other weirder stuff as well, all kind of mixed in. The The acting is not, the voice acting is not the best, um, but it does get better as it goes on. And the story is good enough that it, it keeps it, uh, you know, wherever whatever weaknesses it has, the story is intriguing enough that, if it goes somewhere interesting, which it has so far, it'll be a pretty decent podcast. So I guess the, the ending will, will tell us whether or not it was worth all the time. But uh, I find myself generally listening to new episodes as soon as they come out. So apparently 
I really like it because I don't do that with everything. All right, so that's my recommendation, Tower 4. All right, now back to our show. So I'm here with Amber, the witch of Nakalula, and uh, we've been talking We've been talking about a lot of different stuff on this show. Yes, we have. <laughs> uh, but one of the things we haven't talked about is uh, your dreamwalking experiences. Yes, so dreamwalking is also called lucid dreaming or astral projection. I guess they're all related kind of synonyms for the same thing, basically. And I've always had this ability and I actually remember my dreams and can dream within a dream, do the layered thing, oh, which yeah. is interesting. So I have had some interesting experiences such as just a real quick one. I woke up. This was actually one that woke me up from my sleep, but I, I knew I was awake in a dream, but I was actually sitting up in my body and it was a goetic and um, he was huge, <laughs> tall. And this one had really vivid emerald green eyes. And I can read in my dreams. And a lot of times I'll read books and stuff. Mm -hmm. And they'll usually be showing me hidden books or hidden knowledge. And he gave me, he actually, in my lucid state, in my little spirit body, gave me a book with this beautiful filigree on the outside. And the cover said, Owl Magic. Mm -hmm. It had all this filigree and it had a little white owl on the front. And it was a white book. And he just handed it to me. And those of you who know what the owl means as a totem, you get it. And 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 I asked him I, a question. I said, are, are you so-and-so? Because I was expecting another one. And he looked at me and said, no. He, he said, here. <laughs> he just, he's this huge being. He's, he just, he's handing this to me. Here, take it. And did, did, did you, I don't know, what did, what did you get out of, of taking the book? The interesting thing that I've come to understand whenever I hear owls, especially certain species of owls, and when I and I and I live out out, so so I, it's not unusual to hear, hear an owl. But at one point it was because we live more in toward the cities, toward Birmingham, mm -hmm. and at various places I've lived throughout my life, I have learned that that is not necessarily a bad omen, but it means that something is coming, mm. and and it's going to be a life altering event. Or I need to be very careful who I let in my life at this point in time. Mm. Okay. Because because things are changing. I Owls, to me, they warn me. That's what they mean. And owl magic, you know, the owl, that totem or spirit guide or whatever you want to call it, you feel comfortable calling it, it teaches you discernment to discern and read people. Owl people have the uncanny ability to, to look into people, to see people's intentions, even before people know their own intentions. And that's what I got from that book. Oh, I've, I've, I've been offered books in, in those states. Um, the one I, I most clue that, that stands out the most to me was being, having a, sh a hooded figure in a library, walk up to me and say to me, these six books contain everything you could ever want to know. And I immediately was like, oh, oh my God, you know, and I, and I took them and I opened them up and I got, a, a read a little bit and then immediately closed the book and said, no, I don't just want it handed to me. I want to, I want to discover this stuff and handed them back to him. That's, that's interesting. <laughs> well, that's, what's, uh... <laughs> what's, what's, what is more interesting and connects directly to the show is that one of the things I saw was a, another star that was connected to our sun. And it was almost relayed like uh, it was connected electrically. And the first person I ever interviewed for Where Did the Road Go, it wasn't for Where Did the Road Go, I actually did it on my music show as a, as a test run, uh, was um, the guy who wrote The Lost Star of Myth and Time, Walter Cruttenton, who talks about the evidence for us being in a binary star system. Oh, wow. And so, like, when I read his book, I was like, well, this is the thing I read in the book, you know, that I was offered. This was the little bit I got. And then at some point, I, I got drawn into the electric universe idea, which would explain why we could be in a binary system with a, a sun distant enough uh, that we wouldn't necessarily know it. Oh, yeah. So both things that came out of that book became stuff that I looked more into when I realized, oh, this is this is connected to all this. Well, I wonder, I wonder um, what you think about simulation theory and physics. My husband and I have been talking about that one. Last year, they came out with a couple, a couple articles were published. You know, academic yeah. journals. What do you think? Of, have you did did you see that or read anything about that? I did. I don't remember those in particular. I mean, the very first show I did. Where the road go was with, um, I'm not going to remember his name. I wrote a book called The Universe Solved, which is a simulation theory book. Okay. He, he, uh, oh, what is his name? He was really awesome about it, too. Yeah, because he actually went to, to Cornell, uh, which is, okay. and he knew the radio station that, that this first airs on. 
And so mm-hmm. he was like, yeah, I would love to be your first guest. And I'm total, <laughs> totally blanking on his name. But yeah, I mean, it was simulation theory, which is something that's always interested me. Um, holographic theory as well. Holographic universe from Michael right. Talbot was something that I found very interesting. Um, now, and, do you uh, think either of these explains liminal places? It could. Okay. I mean, I, look, I I find that like if you if you use video games as uh-huh. uh, sort of like a a model for our reality, it, it works incredibly well because it's your character cool. in the video game doesn't need to know about the stuff going on outside of it. You uh-huh. can have uh-huh. all the code for the game there. And yet the character in the game doesn't know all the code. It has to move through it. Just like we have to go through life. We could be living in a, in a world that has no free will. That is a solid thing or only has certain directions we can go in, but we wouldn't know. <laughs> what if goetics are the code or they're part of the code? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that's, yeah, and of course there'd be some people that would say we shouldn't have that knowledge. True. But true. I think we should. I, I, I think that's part of, if, if you want to talk about an eternal soul, that is knowledge, is cracking that code. And I know we're talking about very fringe physics here. My husband would love to be part of the conversation right now. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know if we're living in a simulation per se, but I think that, that like uh, his, uh, oh man, I got to look up his name because uh, I feel bad not remembering his name. But he, he wrote a second book called... Um, Basically, it, it was talking about how, regardless of whether this is a simulation, it behaves like a digital versus analog world. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now I got to look up the universe solved and get his name. Um, yeah. And then I'll remember it right before I see it. <laughs> That's always the way it goes. That's always the way it goes. Jim Elvich. And yeah, what's the name of his other book? The, yeah. The, well, this is Universe Solved Simulated Reality. Um mm-hmm. Which I've never actually read. I had him on, I had heard him on Coast to Coast. It was like, I want to talk to him about this stuff. And he was, you know, nice enough to come on. The other book he has out is called Digital Consciousness. Okay. Yeah. You know, I wonder if a lot of this also explains, we're talking about dream walking, things that that we've experienced in, 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 in the dreaming, in the dream time or the dream walking. Mm-hmm. If that's just another, I mean, layer of it all. And I'm, why not? I mean, I, I really do look, we were talking about earlier, we had mentioned, I think, psychology. Yeah. And I really do look to neuroscience to provide more of these answers than psychology is going to provide, to be honest. And I think that maybe some people have the neurobiology where they're more receptive to seeing oh, the yeah. liminal spaces between the seams, the goetic spirits, the code. <laughs> and I think that maybe you and I are two of those people. Yeah. And, and trauma seems to bring that on too. Oh, I've noticed that as well. Very correct. Very, very, very true. I I find that these beings in the depths of my despair, like there was one time, it, it was, there was after graduate school, there was a lot going on in my life, a lot of changes, just changes. I didn't know where I was going to move and whether I was going to stay at one college and teach or go off. And there was some, I'd recently divorced and all this other stuff. And I was out walking the neighborhood one night and just out after dark, after 10, I'm never out that late. I don't stay up that late. But I was, I was just really upset and, and on the verge of tears, just wanting something or someone to comfort me and was basically calling out for that. Mm-hmm. And later on that night, this is this is where I actually woke up. This is what I, where I was awake. I, I woke up because something else was on the bed. And I, at the time, I had three cats and I had a fourth cat on the bed. And the, this one, my other ones were asleep around me, my other three. And this one was human sized sitting like a cat at the end of my bed <laughs> with a huge head staring at me. Just, just a black cat. I saw a black cat, very sphinx looking with these huge emerald green eyes. And she was just, it was a she, she was just, I could tell the energy. She was just looking at me, like just staring at me, like she stared right into me. And I mean, she was huge and I should have been scared. I mean, if she stood up, she would have been like fast, you know? Yeah. And, and I should have been scared, but I wasn't, I just remember her looking at me and, and she's like, okay, I'm here. I'm, 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 I'm here and I'm going to be here. Lay, lay down and go back to sleep. And I went back to sleep and all of a sudden I'm in this beautiful place where it's a, it's like a high desert and there's, it's this beautiful, like almost like Sumerian looking 
just estate. And I'm in the middle of this courtyard with all these huge cats. And of course, these are actually walking like cats, but there's something between like a, a lion and a lynx. They're really tall and like on, on their four legs, they're walking on four legs and they have these huge ears and these tufts on their ears like a lynx. And they're the, this beautiful kind of sandy gold color. Mm. And they have these collars on, not for ownership, but these are their collar vest. I get the feeling that these collars are for communication or something. It allows them to communicate with, with humans or something, something weird, but they're, they're, these are not pets. These are not owned. These are people. And I, and I remember at this point, I'm in this dream and I'm at this place where I look down, I'm a human child and I'm just running back and forth in between this group of cats, hugging them. <laughs> and these are, these are, you know, they're cats. Yeah. So, and, and that, I don't know if that was actually a place in time. I've never heard of any place like that. Right. But I just remembered that the comfort that that experience brought me at that point in time in my life. And that was very much a lucid dream. Like I woke up from that experience and it was morning and knew that I had had someone else in the room. And um, yeah. Have you had dreams that you couldn't wake up out of? There was one where I really thought I got stuck in a dream and there may have been a couple, but there was, there was, well, there's, there's been two in particular that come immediately to mind, but one was where I dreamed of an entity that I knew from Tennessee and I knew of this person from Tennessee and she's colloquially known, or it is, it's not a she, they are known as the Bell Witch. And oh, there's right. much to upon that story, greatly demonized, but that, that I'll just say person followed me from a child and um, was always a very nurturing character in my life. <laughs> And there was one time that uh, I met her out there, didn't mean to, but someone else had kind of pulled me into this. And this was someone who did practice that high magic stuff that some of your guests practice, someone who did do all that stuff with a very clear intention of messing around. And he, unbeknownst to me, did not ask my permission, did not plan to go dream walking with anybody, pulled me into this dream. And uh, she, it, it did not like that. <laughs> Huh. This this protective person that everyone calls the Bell Witch, which was never a witch and never a woman, uh, didn't like that at all and made sure that kept me there until it knew that he was not in this, this space, this liminal astral space where we were. Yeah. Because it was very uh, – that that was the one time that I've only been scared of that entity called the Bell Witch because I saw I – saw, I saw them get mad at that guy. Now, now, how do you know it's the same entity? Because that's what I've always called it, and it's okay with me telling, calling it that, or oh, okay. re referring to the history of that. I mean, I don't call it the Bell Witch. I actually know what I can call it, but I, I that's something I'll take to my grave. So, but um, wh why do you, what do you think the real story there is? I mean, because I, 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 what was the last show we did on yeah. that? Was uh, Small Town Monsters documentary on it? Oh, and to yeah, me, yeah, yeah. It sounded like a poltergeist. It sounded like a poltergeist who was protecting this girl who might have been abused. Yeah, it. And you, that's a very good take on it. That's a very good take on it. That's that's what I would say. I, I I I would say it is a very real thing, and I think at least in, in, on some level, on some you know plane out there, that can interact on this one, and it is very protective, and it does not like people who hurt women and children, and you know it's it's a I, to me, being a girl child at that time and being a woman, I look at it as something that I, I really love and appreciate and I thank it for its service. And um, so I don't like the way it's been demonized. You know, we know the character of the Bell family. There was a lot there. They were slave owners and the patriarch, John Bell, he was he was abusive. Yeah. And it's rumored he was abusive in every way. Yeah. And in, in fact, a little bit of this story was actually retained enough throughout history that an American haunting that horror movie that's that's a version of the of the story I grew up with right like that John Bell was not a good character and when you're a kid growing up in Tennessee because remember I grew up around the Great Smoky Mountains before moving to Coleman Alabama I grew up with that 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 was one of our tall tales that was one of our fairy tales as a child and when you were a kid in Tennessee back in the 1980s instead of doing Bloody Mary you do the Bell Witch you stand in the bathroom mm -hmm. in the dark around Halloween and turn around and go the Bell Witch the Bell Witch the Bell Witch <laughs> and that was our Bloody Mary so but you know I I always knew that person was there and that person told me that I was a witch when I was yeah, a girl and that because of that I would always be protected oh, okay yeah, I forgot you mentioned that in the first email you you, you wrote me that you had a mm -hmm. experience with the Bell Witch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, but it was it, I, I don't 
it's weird to talk about it because it's not like a scary story. It's not anything bad. It's just, you know, I, well, I've seen it. I've seen this person since then, obviously. But um, it's it's just someone that 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 I care a lot about. And and uh, I don't I don't like I don't like the fact that that's a tourist site and people go there and they stomp all over. I just think that's that's disrespectful. I've never been to Adams, Tennessee, actually. Mm. Adams, Tennessee is more toward Nashville, not you know. But yeah. it, I mean, Tennessee is is the place. So it's just to me, it's something. See, and, and that and that's another thing. To, I just like I was talking about the aesthetics earlier before the break. Like that's not bad to me, you know. And and a lot of people would think, oh, that's so scary. <laughs> like no, right. no, it's really not. <laughs> now you you said that uh, when we were talking earlier. Uh, off air that your husband's had a couple of experiences as well with me. Yeah. Now yeah. remember he's, he's, he's a physicist. So right. he's basically, he would say he's definitely non-believer, very science-based. His um, concentration is actually, is actually biophysics. Mm. So he, um, he's chair of a science department and yeah, we, we, uh, <laughs> one night when I was, dream walking <laughs> going in and out and i guess i ac- accidentally or something fo- kind of followed me back and i woke up and because i used to wake up in the middle of the night after really being out about like in having these interactions and sometimes i'd find someone out in the den sometimes i wouldn't but i went to get a coca-cola out of the fridge because i don't normally drink coca-cola especially at night but i just kind of wanted something kind of sugary and fuzzy after dream walking and mm-hmm. I went back to bed and I was laying back down. I was still drinking the Coke and I heard something singing in a real high pitched voice like this, but I couldn't make out the language. It sounded really old. It sounded like ancient actually, but I could not tell you. It almost sounded like some form of like Welsh mm. or something. And it was, it was just singing. And, and, and I was like, okay, okay. You can cut it out now. And and I, Brian was steering like he, 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 he was bes- beside me in the bed and he was waking up like it was I could tell it was waking him up and annoying him and and it just kept on and kept on I said okay I said look I'm a child of the Morgan I'm a child of the Morgan you can cut it out and it stopped Mm. and I got kind of miffy with it because it was waking Brian up and Brian (laughs) woke up the next morning and he was getting ready for work he's like why were you singing last night were you were you humming or singing or something what what was that and I said oh I'm so glad you heard that too because I know I'm not crazy (laughs) So, yeah, so it's it's been clear audience, stuff like that. Sometimes he'll see shadows and stuff or think he sees something, but mainly it's ghost cats. We have ghost cats in our oh, current house. Yes, I have those so that, too. Yeah, so uh, maybe they're little imps in the image of cats, ghost cats. I don't, I don't mind them. I don't mind them and my cats don't mind them, so they are welcome here. <laughs> What what, what 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 kind of ex- what do they do with with you? For me, I'll I'll usually get them jumping on the bed when I'm trying to sleep. They will run past me in the hall okay. and I'll, and, and, and I'll be like, I don't have a cat that looks like that. Oh, okay. All right. Like there's, there's one that looks like a silver tabby and we don't have a silver short haired silver, silver tabby at all. We, we have a long haired gray tortoise shell and we have, yeah, but that's, that's the closest to a gray cat we have, but this is obviously like a short haired silver tabby. Okay. I've never actually seen one as far as I can remember, but I've, I, I will feel them like feel exactly what it feels like when a cat jumps on the bed. Like I'd feel it mm-hmm. jump up on the bed and start to lay down and kind of knead the the thing, and I'd be like, "All right, which cat is this?" I turn the light on, there'd be no cat there, and I'm like, "Oh, all right." Yeah, <laughs> but it was a very distinct, you know. I mean, it wasn't like a little like vague thing. It was a very like audible tunk when it lands on the bed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I'm. That's interesting because I'm. And you had mentioned a black dog when we were talking yes. during the break. I, I recently had a black dog dream. Actually, I've seen this. This it's a wolf. It's a wolf, and I've seen it twice. Him twice. This in the last few months, and and it was in conjunction with me starting to really study and hone in on the poison path of herbology, especially with um, Kobe Michael's material. I took a class from Kobe Michael. He's an, he's an herbalist basically, and he follows the poison path. And I, I would say he's a witch. I don't know if he would call himself that, but I would say he's one of the few male witches I've, I've actually known. And around the time I knew I was going to take his class, I had a dream that I was in our backyard and it didn't look like our backyard. We had a big, huge datura tree, like the the, the poison path herb, datura. It's called jimson weed around here, okay. but it was in the form of a tree. It had these huge bell-like shaped red blossoms and it was in my backyard. And I mm-hmm. remembered that tree being there and, uh, and I'll be real 
I mean, this dream went on and on. There were so many symbols. But I remember suddenly there was a brick wall behind the tree, the Datura tree, and a white face appeared like a female face, an attractive woman, very dark hair, very pale skin, black eyes. But she was looking behind me and trying, like looking behind me, what would be to her, actually to her left over and i i just saw her like you would see just someone come out of a wall and i thought wait which which one are you like who are you and i'm sitting cross-legged from this tree and suddenly i'm holding one of my cats my cat arabelle and all of a sudden it's twilight and there's this and i feel this presence behind me and it's this huge i mean and they would be huge it's a huge wolf it's this black wolf that comes up behind me and caresses like my side and, and leans into me and nuzzles me. And I'm sitting there holding my cat. He nuzzles my cat. And he's just sitting there with us, just leaning, like leaning into us. And I'm leaning into him and we're under this, this Tura tree. And to the side of me, I, there's suddenly like a screen or a little gate. And I'm in some weird kind of courtyard and I'm not in my backyard, but the, the, the tree is still there. The wolf's there and I'm there with my cat. And we're in some kind of courtyard where there's very much like an, like a city street in front of this courtyard, like some genteel place that's been gentrified. And there's a street that we're looking on, we're spying onto from the courtyard. And there's suddenly a voice that says in this, in this um, little cabinet or, or this, this veiling, this, this awning, this is where the bell witch is here. Do you think the bell witch would, 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 stay, would stay right here? And I sense a presence there. And I don't know why that came into the dream, but I, I realize I'm with all these symbols of poison path, deadly creatures, so-called monsters. And I'm sitting there and I'm looking out at the street and I'm scared of the humans. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I'm terrified of the humans. And, and that, and that, that, that was such a message to my psyche. Like, yeah, you really don't belong among them. Do you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, that's, that's interesting. Um, I always find it interesting when I have dreams that are very clearly, you know, where I live, but something is distinctly different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and and that's, that's, that's that where, you know, you're kind of entering sort of the liminal, like it's, you've you've crossed over, you're no longer in Kansas at that point. (laughs) Right. All right. Well, we're out of time, uh, but uh, you said you'd stick around and do a Patreon. So we'll talk about some other Mm -hmm. stuff in that. Um, Is there anywhere that people can contact you if they want to talk to you? Yeah. Anyone who's interested in anything I'm talking about, you can look me up on Instagram. Um, I don't have like a real public profile. I mean, I do have a public profile, but no big social media accounts. I'm just the witch of Nakalula at the witch of Nakalula. That's me on Instagram. And I basically just talk about gardening and books and and stuff like this occasionally. So yeah. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to take a moment here to thank all of my Patreons. It is because of you that this show is made possible. And I want to give a special shout out to those of you pledging $10 or more. Greg Ross, Illuminati, Madeleine J, Matt in Delaware, Allison Cook, Super Inframan, 36 Dingo, Tim, Andrew Nichols, Matthew Sproul, Midnight Review presents Christine, a blue second-gen MR2 drifting around a Japanese mountain, Patricia Gray Quinta, Alex Whitcomb, American Rambler, Andrew Maines, Andrew Malone, Ann Witowski, Barbara Fisher, Beverly Williamson, Big Boy Limina, Bright Rectangle, Charles Davis, Charles in Florida, Land of the Crazy and Communicable, CJ, Craig Parmenter, Daniel, Diane B, MTK, Eric Citron, Eric Todd, History and Coffee, Jay, Jay Otto Bullet, Jack Huntington, James Lindsay, Jim and Sophie, John Mattingly, John Bracken, John Hooling, Carla Mahoney, Kevin, Kevin Shrek, Cool Kitty, Kristen L, Laser Printer Jam, Lauren McLean, Linda, Linz Jackson K, MJ Armstrong, Mark Brady, Mr. Weird, Ole Andre Olar, Paul Jeffries, Perry Peters, Philosopher of Mirrors, Riker and Stark, Ron Dupre, Sam Sharon, Sarah Horgan, Schmooples, Devourer of Mortal Souls, Stacy Sherwood, Stevie Norman, Strange Stories with the Seeker and Skeptic Podcast, Tactical Therapist, Taylor Bell, The Esoteric Book Club Podcast, Thunderboy, Tyler H. Glimstead, Varosh K., Victoria, Vincent Trewell, Will Gebhard, Will Powell, Ren Collier, Annabelle Smith, Caroline Walker, TDT Skunkworks, Colin Karras, and Craig Sagastumi. Thank you all so very much for the support. There's a lengthy Patreon segment to go along with this. 
So uh, if you want to become a patron, just go to wheretotheroadgo.com and click on the big Patreon link. And it's only $3 a month. You get extra content every week. You get the show a week early. And you get extra things thrown in there as well. I want to welcome uh, three new patr- four new patrons this month. Um, Kyle Reem, Sarah Horgan, Hagbard Celine, and Danielle McGowan. I hope I said everyone's name right. But uh, thank you for becoming members, for joining us. I hope you enjoy the content. I will see you next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support.